Hi, friends. My name is Host Eric. I'm just talking with famous people. And it's my great pleasure tonight to be speaking with Michael Real, who is the authentic main character in a bit of an internet hubbub that relates to an event that occurred to him back when he was just eight years old. I'm just going to quickly recap the basics of the story. He was lost in the woods in North Carolina for a full week by himself when he was eight years old. And there was inclement weather, and it's, uh, you know, rather a wild area. Anyway, it's sparked a lot of speculation online. And so the next thing I want to quickly touch on is to recap how it is that you came about this online. And I'd like to ask you to to uh, to tell us about, about how you found out that there were videos about you online and what that experience was like. Well, what it was, it started out as just people hearing my story and they started Googling me and then they're finding videos on YouTube and this and that. And they're calling me, asking me, you know, is this true or how fabrication it, it, it is or whatever. And a lot of them, like I told them, is not true. So the, the, the community that's taken up this story a lot is in in general, what you call the paranormal community. And part of that is because of some weird aspects of the story, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, but it, it partially just stems from the fact that you did, in fact, spend a full week by yourself outdoors with a T-shirt and pants and sh shoes on without any adults lost in the woods by yourself, right? Yes. That's, that's which, exactly what it comes down to. Which, which is, uh, by itself, absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's like far-fetched, but it is what it is. Well, sure, yeah. And um, the part of what this, the, the paranormal aspects of this story that have come out online link a lot to a cabin and whether or not you were being protected by a magical, mystical grandpa in a cabin this whole time. And so um, let me let me ask you to, to start with articulating who who was along on this trip and some of the and what that cabin story actually resolves out to. Okay, we started out on a trip. It was me, my mother, my four sisters my grandmother and my step grandfather which i called him my grandfather because he was the only one i ever knew as a grandfather and i will say just for the record i have the exact same experience i had a step grandfather but i always just called him grandpa because he was the only one i ever knew so that's not uncommon okay yeah. so did did you in fact during this week in the woods, did you, in fact, stay in a cabin with somebody called Grandpa while you were lost? No. I did not find the cabin until Friday afternoon on July 8th, the, the day before I was found. I stayed in the cabin Friday night. I come out Saturday morning and got berries and crab apples, and then that's when I walked into the 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 ones that actually found me rescued me okay and can we confirm that there was no food in this cabin that you found there was nothing in that cabin other than a wore out sofa a clock on the wall and a shredded curtain in in the cabin it was the only thing that was in the cabin nothing as far as food nothing as far as heat Nothing like that. Now, you did have an actual experience on this larger camping trip, which didn't begin the moment you got lost, you know. Um, you did have an experience with a grandpa that you related to somebody involving bacon. Can you explain that to us? The Saturday morning before I got lost, my grandfather, step grandfather, cooked bacon, eggs, potatoes the whole breakfast feast that you would have on a camping trip 
he he was not with me any time during the week okay right so in other words you related to somebody the the breakfast you had before you got lost yes that was saturday and morning somehow, right and somehow it's gotten conflated online or created into a story of some kind of mystical ghost grandfather that was taking care of you in the woods because your actual biological grandparents were both dead. So you didn't have a biological living, a living biological grandpa, but you did in fact have a grandpa that you called grandpa and he had in fact fed you breakfast before you got lost. Yes, sir. So that so there for everybody who's wondering about this the Michael real mystery regarding whether or not he was in a magical cabin with a with a magical dead grandfather, the answer is no. Though he was in a real cabin, briefly, but he did not eat anything there. Okay, so that's no. the answer to to one big question that everybody's been back and forthing like on the Reddit thread about this uh, about whether or not there's something mystical here okay that's one big question another big issue is a lot of the videos on youtube they report that he was found with his hair washed and combed is that true that is not true at all my hair was a mess it was greasy as all get out and it that is just not true. They they ain't no truth to that. Okay. Now here's a question I had when I initially encountered this subject, and I that was about a year ago, I guess. Um, I was in a phase of watching these spooky campfire video stories that Mister Ballin used to tell, but when they turned more into like true crime stories, then I'm, it's more depressing, you know. I like the ones with a ghost and stuff. <laughs> anyway, I was watching those things, and uh, and I that's how I came across this story. Uh, and uh, I made, and then I, I was looking into it more, like on Reddit and stuff, and I made the, this video. So uh, then, what? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit off track here. Let me re recapture where i'm going here okay so we've gone to the cabin we talked about the hair can you tell uh, what 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 it was that caught my attention was how could a boy live outside at night when it's so cold and not die of hypothermia so could you please explain how your proceedings throughout that week actually went what you did when you did it and so forth what i did is I would during the day I would curl up in a little ball under a tree and sleep during the day. When it come nightfall, I would walk because I was scared that bears, mountain lions, coyotes, or whatever would eat me basically. So I stayed in a little ball during the day and walked at night. I, there was movement to where maybe they wouldn't bother me. Okay. I, I mean, I don't or, know if that makes sense or not, but it, it makes sense for an eight-year-old to think that for sure. Yeah. I mean, I might think I'd probably think that as well. And, you know, I'd probably think uh, if I'm just lying here asleep, then there's no chance of me running away from them or something. Yeah. But uh, can you? So. Can you tell us when you first thought you were lost, when you first realized you were lost? Well, I seen the helicopters of Fort Bragg on Sunday afternoon. I re didn't really realize I was lost until probably Monday morning, Monday afternoon, when I and realized you, I hadn't seen no family, nobody. And you got separated on Saturday morning, right? Yeah, Saturday morning, approximately 9.30 a.m. Okay. And besides the helicopters, was there at any point, did you see any searchers during that time? No. Nobody okay. did I see. And were you looking for people to, to, to flag them down and say, hey, I'm a lost child or something like that? Or were you looking for something in particular? I was looking to get back to where I started at, at the camp, the campsite. 
but I never found it either. So, so during the times when you were walking at night, were you trying to walk towards where you'd come from? I, yeah, I'm guessing I was. Okay. Um, do you remember being scared? Yeah, I was scared after I realized I was lost. Hmm. Did you expect people to come searching for you? Actually, I didn't really think about that. As mm -hmm. far as as people like looking for me, um, I was hoping. I, I guess I was hoping somebody was. Once I realized okay. I was lost. All right. So another thing that's been a point of controversy online is whether or not there were military forces looking for you and i found a newspaper article that that said yes that was the case and you confirmed it for me as well during our earlier conversation on the phone um there were in fact military personnel sent out to look for you right yes sir my daddy spent um uh, he come up saturday morning once he was notified that i was our saturday afternoon when he notified i was lost and once the paratroopers from Fort Bragg, North Carolina got there, he was with the paratroopers from Fort Bragg the rest of the week. And they they presumably combed that area, but they didn't find you, right? Supposedly, that's what that's what the word is. Uh, like I say, I, I found the cabin on Friday afternoon, stayed there Friday night. And I walked out to get the berries and apples uh, Saturday morning is when I walked, you know, into the six-man crew that actually found me. Okay. So when you were found, this is a really interesting uh, component of the story. They, they kind of treated you strangely. Oh, yeah, very strangely. Once they carried me out of woods, approximately a mile and a half, uh, once we got to this little block building, I don't know where exactly it was, but you could hear him talking and asking, should we handcuff him because he may be wild? Because he may be wild. And do you think it's yeah. because your clothes were dirty and tattered and, and your hair was messy? You know, I really don't know, but one of the guys – carried me out on his shoulders i mean i wasn't trying to hit him pull his hair anything like that i was calm they was giving me candy bars and 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 whatever walking out of the woods huh and, and when you when they first saw you they asked your name right or what, tell, tell us what happened when they when they first saw you when, when they first saw me they asked me what is your name and i said michael they said michael chapman i was like no michael real and they all started jumping in, which i didn't understand that i guess it you know because they found me they was happy or whatever okay so they all started like cheering like high-fiving yeah basically. yeah okay yeah um now they asked you if you were michael and yeah. Then they said Michael Chapman. Yep. And and that's not who they were looking for. They were looking for Michael Real. Yeah. What do you think happened there? I think they tried to get me confused on who I really was because I got two cousins by marriage that last name is Chapman. Okay. Well, <laughs> like why would people looking for a boy in the woods need to why why would they want to do that <laughs> I, I, I don't know it don't make no sense i mean the michael Rick chairman out there lost and they I, I don't know i don't know i think that's just maybe they just got the name wrong in their head or something but um okay so do you believe personally that there was anything paranormal about your experience no sir not at all 
Okay. And uh, can you tell us about the experience your mom had while she was waiting for you to be found? Somebody came to her who was, I guess, drunk? There was a guy. I'm, I'm, I'm actually from Hickory, North Carolina. They are a little town outside of Hickory called Hildebrand. The guy left Hildebrand, come to help search for me. Apparently, when he made it to the campsite, he was drunk. He come up to my mother and told her, I know where Michael is. You know, where is he? Blah, blah, blah. He's like he's 100 yards down the road in a garbage can in a burlap sack. They rushed down to the to the trash can, to the burlap sack. There was a burlap sack in the trash can full of blood. But once they done test on it, it was deer blood. It wasn't human blood. How would you like to go through that as a mother? <laughs> I mean, that is some F top stuff right there. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. She, that's, she, that's she was horrible. on the verge of a nervous breakdown at the time. From what I was told, she was on the, uh, the edge of a nervous breakdown. I, I, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, that's absolutely horrible. It's 1983. The distance from the event is the only thing that makes me able to laugh about it at all. It's like, yeah. what were these people? Do you think it was a feature of 1983? Or do you think it was just... I don't know, but that once they interviewed his wife, his wife said he left with no cash on him. He had a full tank of gas, and he was all he had good intentions of coming to the mountain to look for me. But then, when when he got there, he was drunk, and I guess had seen this bloody canvas bag and just jumped to the conclusion that your your body must be in there. I, I'm guessing, but they said once they searched his car, there was several liquor bottles in the trunk. <laughs> okay, well, that's called poor decision making on his part, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, did you have any special wilderness skills before you got lost that helped you to survive? No, I've never been in Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, anything like that. Okay. So do you think that I underestimated my own survival capabilities when I speculated in that video that I would have died of hypothermia? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, so, some people probably would have. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to I don't want to say either way. You know what I'm saying? I just. I know I'm lucky to be here. So what are some of the things that have made you most annoyed when you've been watching these videos on your own story that the truth is not told that outrages me i mean i don't care if the story's told as long as it's told with truth and and people is just getting the articles from the newspaper and may turning it into what they want it to mean it seems like People do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, very, yeah. I'm very both flattered and grateful that you reached out to me to uh, to get the facts out there. I think it, it, after this video publishes, basically, there's not going to be anybody who can dispute the realities of the thing. Now, yeah. it, is it? It's also the case that they strapped, they wouldn't let you see your mom, right? Until so after yes. they strapped you to a gurney. They put me in that little block building after they found me when they was talking about handcuffing me. They put me in a room. It was probably 12 by 12, 15. It was a pretty good size room for an eight-year-old. They put me on the gurney. On the way to the hospital is when I finally seen my mother and my uncle. They would not let me see them until I was strapped down to a gurney on the way to the hospital. Like what? What was going on through the minds of the adults who thought you were somehow a danger? I have no clue. I I don't know. 
Now, this event must have been fairly traumatizing for you and your family, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Even to this day, almost 40 years later, I still have nightmares. I don't sleep well from July 2nd to July 9th. I'm up and down all hours in the night. I I I don't want to know. It's just I have nightmares. I still have nightmares. What can you tell us a little bit about a little bit more about what those nightmares are? are they are they visuals from the experience? Yes. I find myself in the woods with nobody around. I can holler and 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 holler for whoever, and it's like nobody's there. I wake up jerking, like like startled, I guess. And the wife will wake me up and say, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" It's like you know, it's just another nightmare. Wow, I mean, and that get, that just goes to show you the extent to which trauma impacts people for potentially their entire lives. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know the doctor said I wouldn't have no physical damage, but he didn't say nothing about the mind damage. Yeah, in fact, well, he did say something about it. He said something very dismissive. He said, "You'll be back playing normal, fine, in a couple of days." Yep. Which nobody would say nowadays. People would have some concept of the fact that traumatizing experiences are incredibly impactful on people's ontologies. You know. Yeah. So. Um, is it something that uh, that you're that was sort of reinitiated your thinking about it when you discovered that people were making videos about it online? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I like I say, I, I don't care if the story's told as long as it's told with truth. And the way you know you've done the one story that I've seen, and you was. You was right on target with well, thank comparing you. with comparing, you know, uh, articles to this one and that one and what this doctor said and what this person said, whatever. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. It means a lot to me that you reached out to me to uh, to help you get your story out there. Yeah. Is, is, is there anything else that you'd like to, to tell us about the experience or its impacts? um that we haven't covered yet i don't know like i say i i just i just want the story to be told true if it's going to be told tell it like it is get the facts out there i mean you know i i know there are a lot of people thinking it's aliens or or you know whatever whatever i you know it don't even matter i just want them to know the the, the real story behind it what really happened Okay, well, I think after people see this video, we can all agree the magical stories regarding Michael Real and his experience in the woods are just BS, hereby debunked. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot, Michael, and um, I again, I greatly appreciate you reaching out to me, and thanks to the audience for watching. Have a good evening. Thanks. You too. Okay.